is talk today about class components in React. So we'll do a bit of an intro. Uh, we'll talk about uh, OOP or uh, OOPS as it's sometimes called, which of course stands for Object Oriented Programming. I just like the word OOP because it sounds so, so, uh, so cool. Um, a bit of a review of ES6 classes. We did a bit of this, um, I think the first week and the second week did uh, our recursion with vampires, uh, but we didn't really dig into classes a lot. We just used classes only so we could just simply do recursion with our with our fun vampires. So we'll do a little more, a bit on classes, but not too much, only enough to get us uh, introduced to the concept of classes. We're not going to really dive into the full concept of uh, object-oriented programming because that's quite a large topic. And then we'll make ourselves a Create React app. And I put a question mark beside that because we're going to talk about this a little more. And then, well, of course, we're going to write ourselves a class-based component, of course. And we'll talk about the usual suspects, um, JSX, naturally, and of course, props, what component is a complete without some fun props, and then events on click, on change, all these things we do in uh, components, and then state with the usual two or three asterisks beside it, because we do know that state is always something that we have to watch out for in components. It's the same with class components. We'll talk about those as well. A little bit of life cycle methods, something we don't have in functional components. Now we have this concept of the life cycle of a React component. And we'll talk about that. A bit of a history on where this stuff came from, class versus functional. And we'll talk about when we should use class components in our projects. Right. So it's a this is a fun day. So let's let's start with a bit of a uh, bit of oops or uh, object oriented programming. Now we know. Let's make ourselves a little uh, file here. Make a new file. I'm going to call it shapes.js for lack of a better name. Okay. We know we can create classes in JavaScript. So we have. Java script classes. Now, the interesting thing about JavaScript is that although now it was ES6, they introduced the word class. That's an ES6 construct. Before that, there was no classes. All we had was functions with prototypes and objects and all these things, right? There was no classes. In ES6, they introduced this concept of the class. But the interesting thing is it does not exist, at least in JavaScript. Although we have classes in JavaScript, they're not real. They don't actually exist as part of the, of the language. Now, what does that mean? We have classes. We've made our vampire classes. That's true. But Unlike other languages, such as Java or C++, or we'll work on Ruby a bit later on, um, they're not real classes. You may have heard this term before, syntactic sugar. That's what classes are. And JavaScript has a number of these uh, syntactic sugar, or sugar coding, sometimes we call it, or sugar wrapper. What they do is they they take an existing concept, such as functions and prototypes and closures, and they wrap it in some sugar and they call it a class. But JavaScript doesn't have any native class functionality. It's not built in. It's just ES5. You could do the same thing in ES5 JavaScript. It just takes a lot more code and not as easy to read. All they do is they they packaged it together in class. But the, it really is just um, using prototypes and, and functions. Just like we have promises, you know that, but you may have heard of this thing called async and await, which promises to make promises look like synchronous code. But once again, this is fake. It doesn't exist. It's just a wrapper or a syntactic sugar around promises. 
And we got to be really careful using these things because they are not synchronous code. And if you treat them like they are, you can really dig yourself a hole really fast. And this is why we encourage you to not use async await a lot yet in your projects. Use promises because you will dig yourself a hole because these, although they appear to be synchronous code, they are not. They are promises. Anyway, but that's not our talk for today. We're going to talk about classes. We can make a class. So if I make a, a simple class, we know we can do this. I can go class. There. I can go class. The keyword class. And I can say my class. And I can make a class. Just like that. So that is the, the class. We can think of it as the template of an object. It, this doesn't exist by itself. I can't really console log this thing. It's more of a a type, although once again, JavaScript, that's not real, but in most languages, a class will become a type. I now have a type of my class, so I can declare a variable with that type. And of course, to do that, I would go const uh, my class equals new my class. And now I have an instance of, there's a lot of jargon in, um, object-oriented programming. Um, so we're going to talk about a lot of that, but instance of. So my class is an instance of the class, capital M, my class. I know the names are kind of confusing, but I have no imagination. So this is an instance of. This is the, the class. This is now an object, which is, I guess, a you have realized an instance of this class. So we can console log this thing. Console log my class. Let's see what it looks like. Where am I here? There it is. Let's go uh, node shapes. Yes. There. Interestingly enough, unlike a normal object where I just get the empty braces, I get the empty braces, but I get the type as well. So console log has noticed, hey, this is a, this is an object that was generated from a class. Tip, strictly speaking, it's a template, but it's a class of my class. Okay. Right. So perfect. So I can make other classes. Let's make ourselves a, uh, a simpler class. Um, we're gonna make some shapes. These are always fun to play with because we always know what shapes are. Make a class class and I'll call it shape. There, there is my shape and we can put various things inside class. Now, this is going to be a generic shape. It could be any shape, circle, square, cube, line, dot, really anything. So it doesn't really have a lot of attributes. Um, it doesn't even have a length because a, a, a point doesn't even have a length. doesn't have well, zero length or technically a zero a circumference. So I'm not going to give it any um, attributes, but I can give it a function. I'm going to say, say your name there. It has a function called say name. And it'll say, I am a shape. And that's pretty much it. There's my, my class shape. It's a very generic class. It can be anything. One of those concepts of object oriented programming um, is you can turn something into something else. It's called polymorphism. Don't worry about the word but this shape can be anything. I can make another class out of this shape. For instance, what if I had a line? Class line, and we can extend classes, right? So extends my shape. There, and now I have a class which extends shape. And by the way, I can go ahead and run my shape. Let's go let shape. And we'll say then shape equals a new shape. So now we have instantiated a shape. Now let's just go and call our shape dot say name or function. Okay. Okay. So it's a shape. Okay. And I've also got a line, which is also a shape. Let's make ourselves another shape. Shape equals a new 
line and we'll say the shape dot say name there try this well they're both shapes makes sense so now we have a line which is an extension of line extends shape doesn't extend by much doesn't add any value to it yet but it is based on shape we could say that shape is the sometimes called the parent class um, but you'll hear this term called subclass where this is more general this is more specific so this is a subclass of shape we can have circles lines squares they're all subclass like subspecies i guess a subclass of shape so you'll hear this term subclass and superclass more jargon of uh, object oriented programming so this is the subclass this is the superclass and i can add functionality to my line because now a line can have in an attribute such as a length and we can have a uh, constructor constructor which is a special um, function name in classes in JavaScript. And by the way, this is these are concepts that are not just specific to JavaScript. Um, all object-oriented languages have this concept of um, extends and constructor and superclass, subclass. These are really universal concepts, regardless of the language. JavaScript has done just a very simple version of, uh, of OOP. So I guess I've got my constructor, and my constructor can take parameters, length, okay. And I can then save the length. I would go this dot length equals length. And I've saved this length in this new object, a new class called line, so it is an extension of it is expanded on the constant shape. And let's see what happens here. What's it going to say to me? Oh, I'm getting an error. It says you must call the super constructor. I like that word, super constructor. Sounds like a superhero before accessing this. So now I have a derived class. It's another uh, term, derived class, subclass, same kind of thing. Um, I have to call the super constructor. And that's just called super, just super, like that. That's all. If you don't give a class a constructor, it just gets one that does nothing and takes no parameters. So it's implied. So I have to do something. I have to call super. Just one of those rules of JavaScript. You have to call super before you can access anything with this in the uh, in the constructor. And now, there, I'm a shape, I'm a shape. And now I have two shapes. They're both shapes, by the way. As far as I'm concerned here, they are both shapes. I really can't tell the difference between these two, at least looking at this. They both say that they're a shape. Okay. Now I can maybe extend some more. There's not much I can do with this. I can maybe I can maybe console log the uh the length. So I'll console log the uh shape dot length. Since this is a shape it is also is a line you hear this term is a it's that concept of inheritance and these are actually real things these terms and is a is a shape is a line so a line is a shape a line has a length so if i console log it undefined so if i do a line with a parameter i'll give it i'll give it a four okay and now my length is four. Okay. The when you instantiate a class in an object, if it expects parameters in its constructors, you have to give it the parameters. Otherwise, you get undefined, of course. So far, pretty straightforward stuff. And we're not going to dive too much deeper into classes, by the way, just enough so we can understand what's going on in React class components. Let's make ourselves another shape. Wow. Okay, class, let's make a two-dimensional line. What's, this is a one-dimensional shape, a line. What would a two-dimensional line be? Probably a rectangle, right? 
rectangle. Is that close? I think it is. A rectangle and extends a line. Now I've got all the steps. You got rectangle extends line and line extends shape. So now if I do the same thing with my rectangle, there, and make a new rectangle, what do I get? I get, I'm also a shape. So this rectangle is also a shape. So now I've uh, extended rectangle. Okay. And, but how about this? What about the length? Can I get the length as well of my rectangle? Let's take a look. And I can, because the rectangle is inheriting. It's this concept of inheritance. There's there's four real concepts in object-oriented programming, which we're not going to go too deep into, uh, but inheritance is the one we're really concerned with. We inherit the attributes of the parent. So since line had a length, rectangle gets a length. So really, rectangle looks just like a line, and we can treat it like a line, or we can treat it like a shape. Here, we're treating a rectangle like a line. Shape dot length. So we can treat it like, we can also treat it like a shape because it has the same name. That's this polymorphism thing, but we're not going to talk too much about that, honestly. Okay, so I can add more attributes now. I have a length and a width. So I need a constructor. And now I'll give it a, I'll say, length and a width. There. Now I've already got length. So I inherit that. So if I call the super with the length, that's taken care of for me. But now I have this width, this dot width equals the parameter width. There, okay. So call my super with length. And now I have that. And now I have a rectangle. In fact, let's console log in for fun. Let's go ahead and console log our whole shape. And what does it look like? Let's console log this shape. Okay. And I'm going to say rectangle four, and I'll say uh, width of, I'll say two. Okay. Okay. So length and width. Totally no surprise. All right. And now, of course, I can have another method, maybe area. So area, and I'm going to say returns the, um, the width times the length. So we have to say this. One thing about classes you learn pretty quick is you really have to have this with everything. This is one of the problems with classes, by the way, <laughs> another joke, um, is, is this. So I have to go this dot width times this dot length. There. And now I can console log my uh, shape dot area, which is now a function. And I should get eight, which is the area of my two by four. Okay. So far, so good. Okay. I'm inheriting length. I still have length and I inherited that, but now I have this function area. Okay. So you notice these are all shapes though. They still have the same name, same name, same name. We inherited stuff. I inherited the length from my, my line. So I didn't have to redo that. I just called super to activate it. And then I added on this, this added value of width. And that's the concept of um, inheritance. Let's do one more thing, because this is kind of important. You, you notice that all of these are a shape. Why? Because I can call say name. And if I knew nothing else about any of these objects, I know that they're, 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 they're an, a shape and I can treat them and I, or I could pass them to any function that expected a shape. 
because they've got the same name function. But that's not very convenient. I'm a shape, I'm a shape, I'm a shape. You know, that doesn't make much sense. What I can do, I can override this function. Say name, I can in my line, I can override a function. Say name, I am a line or in a rectangle. I can override and say, I am a rectangle. There, now when I run this, there, I'm a line of rectangle. So this is this concept of overriding. So two things we're gonna deal with today. Inheritance, in other words, because all of these are still a shape, you get this same name by virtue of being a shape. And the concept of overriding a function or a method to make it do something different. So that's really all we have to talk about for classes today. Uh, that's kind of the end of our theory part of this uh, of this lecture. Just bear in mind that there's inheritance. You can extend classes, but even though you extend these, this rectangle, it's still a line and it's still a shape. So even though it's a rectangle is a rectangle, it is still a, or it is a line. A rectangle is a shape and it inherits all the attributes from a shape and from a constant log length and from a line. Okay, that's enough of our, of our shapes. Let's take a look now at how to create a React app. Now, I am pretty sure everyone knows how to create a React app. Can someone tell me how I would create a React app? It's a bit of a trick question too. So how would I create a React app? One person must know. What do I type in my command line to create a React app? Here, new projects, there's nothing in here. Okay, what would I do to create a React app? Yeah, cool, of course. NPX, create React app. Great answer, NPX. Create React app my CRA app. And this is, you would think, the correct way to create a React app. Let's talk about that for a second. There has been some recent developments in React where that is not necessarily the case anymore. Let's take a look at some of the documentation. Goodbye, create React app. So the React team removed create React app from the official documentation. It is no longer the default method of setting up a new project in React. It is gone. Create React, create React app is now dead. As of, I think it's uh, April of this year. It's pretty recent, okay? Take a look, that's some more. Um, there we go. It was dead. So it has been around for a very long time. That was March. There we go. March, React dropped support for Create React app. They no longer support it. Okay. And why? Well, it's been around forever and it loads a lot of stuff in your, um, in your project. So going forward, I do not use Create React App, and most people now do not use Create React App. Our, our Compass uh, documentation still has it, but that's probably gonna change really soon. Now let's find out why. Let's make ourselves Create React App. Let's take a, pull up a clock, I gotta time this thing. Okay, ready? I'll, I'll start, I'll click enter. Oh, I guess I gotta, can't do both at the same time. There, okay. Let's say it started at 52. And my machine's pretty fast. I've got a decent machine. I've got a really nice NVMe uh, SSD hard drive, really fast. The only thing I spent money on is this whole computer. I literally do not spend any more than about 300 bucks on a computer, but I spent 80 bucks for a, an SSD on this computer. So it's like 380 for this computer. 
Apart from that, I never spend money on computers. Don't have to. This thing's a nice i7, pretty recent gen. Um, I think it was like 320 total for this computer, plus the, the new RAM. Okay, so it's getting there. It's the, over 30 seconds now. It's like half done. <sighs> Come on. Do, 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 do. Come on. Come on. You can do it. I'm coming up a minute now. 45. I think it's almost done. 48, 49. It's almost done. 52. More stuff? Again? Oh, that was just part one. There's more stuff coming. Oh, seriously. More stuff. Oh, come on. Ah, finally done. That was a bit of time, wasn't it? I'm going to fast machine. It took a bit of time to uh, to get this going, didn't it? And let's take a look at this. Let's go a uh, DU minus SH. And it took 300, or it takes up 367 megabytes. Okay. And some alternatives. Yeah, so Vit next and Remix, exactly. Um, probably we're going to go with Vit because that is the most common um, non-framework uh, replacement for Create React app because it's a library. Um, yes, and Vit is uh, French for fast, but of course Vit is not a verb. It is a proper name, right? Name. So um, I've heard various pronunciations of Vit. Some people pronounce it Vit. Some people pronounce it Vit. Um, but I do believe that this is the pronunciation that the authors um, intended was Vit. Because once again, it is no longer a French word. It is a proper name. And when you have your name, the only person who gets to decide how to pronounce your name is you. I pronounce my name Gary, not Jerry. And I'm sure down in Texas, someone is going to call me Jerry. So my name's Gary. Okay. So Vite. Let's take a look at Vite. Vite is actually pretty good. There. Has anybody tried Vite? Is it pronounced Jeet? Ah, okay. Let's take a look. Has anybody tried Vite at all? Let's take a look. So to use it, so getting started. I want to get started. There we go. And to use Vite is pretty straightforward. We simply npm create Vite at latest. Let's try that. Let's go to our command line. There it is. And now make another one. npm is npm. It's interesting. I'll call it my read app. I want, oh, oh, cool. I want React. I want JavaScript. That was it. I didn't even have time to turn my timer. I was, I think it was less than a tenth of a second, and my React app is now built. There. And it's uh it's all built and ready to go. Let's take a look. CD my read app. And there it is. Yeah. It's all built and ready to go. Now, they did cheat, didn't they? They didn't install no modules. It's kind of cheating. You don't have to go npm install. So let's time this one. There. Okay. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Oh, eight. And a half seconds, still pretty fast. Okay. And to start it though is very fast, as you probably know. NPM run. NPM. Now it's not start. I discovered that. Doesn't work. Let's take a look at the uh beat app. Turns out it's npm run dev. Now look at the uh package.json you get, you get this run dev. A little bit different. But apart from that, it fires up in a second. You get this cool menu. You can press H and you can restart the server, open in browser. A lot of cool options. So I can open this in the browser, press O, and up it comes. Very, very fast. And I even get a counter. 
I love counters. Look at this. Okay. So it beats a good choice. It is a, um, not a framework, something like next, which is a framework, which really imposes on you a very specific way of doing things. I tend to break towards not frameworks. I've learned that over my many, many years in this business, I tend to avoid frameworks because I've been burned way too many times. Okay. Here's my feed app. As we know, they look really similar to a CRA app, don't they? They've got an index HTML with our root. It's just outside. It's kind of close, isn't it? It's also got a public, but there's nothing in there, right? We don't, nothing is really in there that we use. Turns out our index HTML is here. And inside our source, we have our, instead of an index.jss, we have a main.jsx, which looks the same, doesn't it? As our index.jsx. There's no difference or JS, except everything must be called JSX. Interestingly enough, must be called .js. If you try to make a JS file, it's going to complain. So everything has to be JSX. It's one of those things. I'm going to turn off strict mode because that's, we don't want things double rendering on us for now. Now let's put this here. Look cleaner. There we go. Okay. So this looks exactly the same. I've got my index HTML with my, my root and I've got my um, create root and then my render. Really similar. Which, this is one of the reasons it is so popular is because it is so similar to create React app. It's a really a low bar to switch between the two and it's crazy fast. Okay, let's give it a try. So I've got my app.js. Let's start my app. So here we go. I think I put it inside my, there it is. Oh, MPM start. Oh, run dev. You know, I'm so used to it. I almost always do this because I am so used to start. I put a start in here. <laughs> I still haven't broken the habit. I put my start here, although this is probably bad practice, but I, I can't break it yet. So I'm going to go MPM start. There we go. Whoops. There we go. Um, and of course, press H and I can open this in my browser. I like this restart feature. That's very cool. You can restart your server in case things get a little wonky and open a browser. It's also very cool. And there is my, uh, my app, Hello React class. Okay. So let's go ahead and make ourselves a class component. So what's the difference between a class component and a non-class component? We have this, our app.jsx. This is a functional component. We can tell because it has a, has a function word, doesn't it? So there's our, our function right there. Okay. Let's make a class component. I'll put it in components, make a new file, and I'll call it my class component. JSX because uh, it does expect that. Okay, now my component has to be a React component. Okay, let's take a look. What does React say? How to make class components. So the base class for a component is a component. It does say, uh, don't use these. <laughs> okay, we definitely recommend using functions don't use classes. They even tell you, do not use components. We'll, we'll, we'll um, ignore that warning and carry on at our own risk. So there, that's not bad. Class, my class name, extends component. And it has this weird render thing in it. Let's try that. Let's go ahead and we'll say class, call it my class component. There. And extends component. And it's the React component. So all React class components extend the component class. This is the React component class. Just like our rectangle extended a line and a, a shape. Okay, so there's my class component. And I'm going to export that because I always forget that. My class component. Okay, 
Now, because I extend component, I get a bunch of things for free, okay? But one thing I don't get is this thing won't render. If I try and use this, let's watch what happens. Try and use my, my class component. I'll put it, where should I put it? I'll put it right here. My class component, let's take a look. Pointy bracket, my class component. Okay, let's take a look. Ooh, didn't like that. What did it say? It says, ooh, nasty error. No render method found. Okay, so it looks like you can't just make a class. It looks like it's expecting a render method. Okay. So I need a render. You don't get that for free. So you have to give it a render. Render. Okay. So there is my render. And now it works. Let's take a look. There. Now it's happy. I gave it a render function. Returns nothing. But unlike um, function components, it doesn't have to return anything. As long as it has one, it's fine. Okay. And this part, this is exactly the same, okay? It has a return. And I'm gonna return JSX. I'll say, well, I'll say maybe a div. And I'll call this class component. There, so there's my class component and there it is. So it's kind of similar to functional component. It's a little different, but this part's the same. So the return of your render is like the return from your functional component. This is where your JSX lives, right there, okay? So it's not that bad yet. Just you have to have the class extends, got to have a render, but apart from that, it's kind of the same. And you can also give your component props. So if I made some props, maybe I'll give it some text text equals some text. Well, how do I use some text? Well, that's of course is props, but where do I get those from? Huh? Well, that is something you inherit. There is a props or it's called this dot props. So this dot props, you inherit this from the component and it is populated when the component is instantiated and you get the props, what it's called. So I can do this and I can just say, instead of that, I'll just call this my, this dot props. There. Oh, and let's take a look. Oh, objects, hold on, dot text, yeah, of course, there we go. Some text, so this dot props dot text, what you'll commonly see, because this is really an easy mistake to make, you'll almost always see this const props equals this dot props. To avoid that, that mistake, we almost always do this. I always do this as well, there. Because this can be a problem with uh, class components, and I'm gonna say that a lot of times today. All right, piece of cake. And you notice my app, it just called the component the same way. It didn't know that it was a class component. It just called it. It had no idea it was a class or a functional. And a lot of libraries that you may use in React, they probably are still using class components, but we don't know that. This app has no idea that it's using a class component. It just called a component. All right. Well, that's cool. But what about using state? So that's where it gets interesting. We want to use state. For example, I want to maybe put some kind of counter in my uh, in my app. Where do I put this thing? Now I can't use use state because that's a hook, and we have to use something different. Now, like every class, you get a constructor, or you can override 
the default constructor. The default constructor is always just like this. So this is what you get for free, like this. In every class, we can override that. We give it one, and it always gets props. So when React calls your function, it'll call the constructor with the props. And we have to do super props. This is boilerplate. Pretty much every component is going to have this constructor props, super props. It's just you're always going to have those few lines right there. And now we're going to declare our state. So this is where it is really different from function components. Turns out state is just an attribute. This dot state equals an object. And that is your state. You get one of them, only one. You don't get multiples. Unlike with use state, you can have as many use states as you want. But in class components, you get one. And it's called state. And that's it. Okay, there's no choice. Now you may wonder, this sounds really familiar. A state object. Haven't I seen that before? Yeah. Um, you will see these state objects still floating around in functional components. People got in the habit of having a state object. So to make things easier for themselves, they just transfer that across to functional components. Just said, a uh, use state, state, set state. And they did it. Horrible practice, but they still do that, okay? It's really not recommended by React. Uh, they actually tell you not to do that as a, um, in functional components. So there's my state, and now I can have a counter in my state. Now this is an object, so I'll say counter colon zero. Okay, so there is my state. A little different. You have to have a constructor. In the constructor, you can set your state. This is my initial state. So when this, this component renders or this class instantiates, I get my state with a counter set to zero. Okay. And if I want to um, render my state, let's put another div here. So we get we keep the, uh, the one parent rule. There, I'm going to put my, uh, my counter here. So now I want to get my state.counter, but this is a, a class. So it's this dot state dot counter. There's a lot of this in uh, class components. And I get a zero. So far, it's not so bad. It's, it's a bit of overhead though, isn't it? Now let's take a look at how this thing works. Interestingly enough, this is what's called a long-lived object. In functional components, here, this is a, a function, and it runs once. And it runs once for every single, single render. Okay? But with a class or with an object, this runs once, but this object survives. It sticks around. That's why this state is persistent now, because this is now an object based on this class. So it's long lived. The render now is just this part here. Remember we talked about last week where in a functional component, you can't just run this part of the function over and over again. Well, with a class component, you do. You run the render over and over. This part only runs once. So as you can see, this state survives because the whole thing is not running anymore. Just the render function runs. On every render, it runs render. The same rules apply. Change of state causes a render. That part hasn't changed. Okay. So this is pretty cool, right? So we can add key value pairs to our uh, state. Okay. Let's talk about something else. Let's talk about how do we handle events? Now, this is the fun one. Okay, on click and edit react or uh, affects our state as well. Let's go ahead and make ourselves our typical button. We'll make our, make our plus button right beside this. Okay, so go ahead. 
make myself a, uh, a button. So I'll put it here, make a button like that. Okay, and I'll put plus. How's it looking? So far, so good. Let's make it smaller, and I'll make this a lot skinnier so I can see what's going on. I like them both see both at the same time. There we go. Okay. So in the functional component world, I would put an on click on my button. And I would do the same here. On click. On click equals something. Needs to be a, a function. Okay. So well, I'll make a function. I'll call it increment, like I've always done. So now I have a function called increment. Now I need a function increment. Now I can't just go this. I can't do this because this is a class. It's not going to like this. Okay. Instead, I have to declare my my function, don't I? And instead, it's going to be this. I'll make a function called increment. Increment. Just like that. It's a class. We have to declare them this way. It's a little different. Okay. And for now, let's just have this thing console log that we uh we clicked it. So I'll just say console log increment called. Okay. So far, doing pretty good. There's a bit of overhead, as you can see, and a lot of this is kicking around here. But they're not that bad, uh, at least not yet. Okay, and let's take a look. And, oh, look at this. Not defined. This. Ah, this is a problem with class components. And that really is a true statement. You must have this pretty much everywhere. Okay. There's my, uh, okay, let's turn my console log on. And yes, success. I have an event handler. So, so far, this thing's working exactly like I expected. Great. Right again. One, two, three. It's now calling my um, increment. So, what I need to do now is somehow have this thing set my state. Right. So it turns out there is a function called set state. You inherit set state from component. So we call this, everything has this dot set state like this, right? Okay. And now I'm going to set my state. Now, this is an object. Now, this is where it gets tricky because now there are always these large objects. Now, I have to replace this object with another object. Okay. So, a new state. For example, I'll just say a new state. I'll just say right here. Let's make a new state. Const new state equals an object with counter equals to this dot state dot counter plus one. Wow. And I'm going to call my set state to my new state. So this is the pattern. There's one function. Unlike use state, we have many functions. There is only the one function set state. That's all you got. And it sets this object. So set state always takes an object. And I start to see where a lot of the stuff came from in our projects, where we have a state object calling set state to our new state. Let's watch what happens here, because this is where it gets really, really interesting. Ah, this is undefined. What on earth does that mean? This is undefined. Increment called. Then I got this on, it says on line 16. Okay, line 16. This is undefined. Now, how on earth can this be undefined? Is this, it's like, it's like saying I'm undefined. Maybe I am. Maybe I'm a, I'm a hologram, but how can this be undefined? And that's where it gets really interesting 
with state and event handlers in React class components. So we'll take a bit of a break. So when we left, uh, we had this really odd error saying, this is not defined. It's really a little more helpful. It actually used to say, set state is not defined. At least it's changed a bit now. And now newer versions of React say, this is not defined. With which, although sounds rather odd, it's actually more helpful than saying, uh, set state is not defined because this is actually what's going on. This is in fact undefined and we can prove that. Let's go ahead and just comment this for now. And let's comment this. It says this is undefined. Is that true? Let's go ahead and comment this there. And I get a comment. Yeah. This is in fact undefined, but how can that be? Because I'm inside my inside my class here. So it doesn't make much sense. If I'm inside the class and I'm calling a class method, how can my this be undefined? And this is one of those interesting things about JavaScript and how this works. So the way this is working is I'm building some DOM elements, a div, a div, uh, my counter, and a button. So I'm building a button in the DOM. And I'm giving it an on-click handler. This means that the button is going to call my increment function. So it is the button that calls it. Okay. So you think, well, does that mean the button is the this? And you'd be correct, except for one interesting rule of uh, of JavaScript. Right here it says, let's take a look. There's actually a JavaScript. I'm trying to find it right. There's a JavaScript. Um, it's hard to find. There's a rule in JavaScript that says when you're running in strict mode, the this of an event handler, which would normally be the window of the DOM, instead becomes undefined when running in strict mode. But we're not in strict mode. In fact, I know for a fact, I deleted that strict mode there. So I'm not in strict mode. So why is it just still giving my me my this is undefined. Well, there's another rule in JavaScript <laughs> that says the bodies of class declarations and class expressions are executed in strict mode. Um, and getter and setter functions are also executed, executed in strict mode if you're inside a class. So the rule is if you're inside a class, which we are, the um, methods are run in strict mode. And the other rule says, if you're in a DOM and you're in strict mode, the window, which is the, the this context of this increment function, becomes undefined. It's rather obscure, but it does follow the rules. It's just, make a long story short, this is in fact undefined, and this is expected behavior. Okay. Um, it's called default binding. Um, and because this is the global object, uh, the window. And in strict mode, the global object becomes undefined. And we're in strict mode because we're inside a class. Huh. So what does that do for us? Like, how can we fix this? What can we do? Well, what we have to do is this thing's calling our anchored function. Found the anchored function, but when the anchor function tries to find it's this, it's this is undefined. And this is a very annoying problem in class components in React. And we're stuck with it. And how do we get around this? Well, what we need right now, we have this increment function. And when it's called, 
it's this becomes the, the global object, the window, which is undefined in strict mode. So we have an increment that has the this is undefined. What we need is an increment whose this is not undefined. <laughs> so we need our, our this is undefined. We need one that has a this that's not undefined. In fact, it's this is the this of this class or this object. So that's what we need to do. Somehow modify this increment function so it's this becomes the this of this thing here. So when we go this dot state, we get the actual state. Huh. Okay. So what do we do? What we do is we actually have to replace this increment function with a copy of it whose this has been modified. Anyone loving class components yet? Isn't it cool? They're great, aren't they? Yes. So this is what we have to do. No pun intended, I guess. Inside the constructor, we have to do something really interesting. Right here. Okay. Need to replace our increment. So this dot increment. Okay. I'm going to replace it with this dot increment. And we're going to call a function that will allow us to bind a different this to it. And that function is, of course, called bind. One we have not used at all or much until now, it's called bind. What on earth is the bind function? Huh. What is that? Java script bind. Oh, there it is. Okay, it says creates a new bound function. Okay. There, let's take a look and okay. So a new function when called calls this function with its this set to the provided value. In other words, you give it a parameter, that becomes the new this. This is one of those really obscure things we don't do a lot in JavaScript, but when we do it with classes, because classes are not quite real and they have some quirks, this is one thing we have to do in class components React. So we have to change this by calling bind. So we're gonna call bind, but bind to what? We want the new this to be what? Anyone? What do you want the new this to be? Well, this, yeah, thank you, this. What? <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> Anybody's head hurt yet? So this increment equals this increment of bind, bind to this, because this, in at this point of time of this constructor, this is now the this of this component. So now this increment has been modified or replaced, in other words, with the same function with a new one bound to this. Yes, I know it is. Um, it hurts my head too. Okay. Ah. But now what happens if I click plus? Oh, look at my this. Now my this is looks like an object with, oh, some stuff. Wow. It looks like my this now has stuff. And I have an increment function and I have a set state function and all kinds of cool stuff. So now I can probably call my set state. Ah, yeah. This is the problem with class components, literally. And it works. Look at this. I don't need my console log anymore. And we're all happy again. So this is something we have to do for every function that we want to call as a callback in or as an a event handler. We must bind it's this to this. Um, head's hurting again. Okay. Very important. Okay. So now it's not bad. It just, you get used to it and it works. It works every time. And it's just one of those weird things. It's a very common pattern in CBCs, class-based components. You see it all the time, one for each one. Does it sound like a pain? It sure does. Uh, but it's something we have to do.
to make it work. Otherwise, our event handler functions will not work. There's another way to handle it, which we'll talk about in a second. But this is the way it works in this instance. We've got a functional input. We have to rebind that function with a new this. Okay, let's try another one. We'll talk about the set state function because it turns out it behaves very interesting. Let's make ourselves another state. We'll say text. Sure. Make it a string. There, there's some text inside my state. I'm going to make myself an input. So go in here, just make some, some random input. There. Put it down here, I guess. Um, how are my divs doing? I need no div. Okay. I'll make an input. There we go. Okay, how's the look? Looks like an input. I can probably get away with only uh, a self-closing one. And I can. Okay. So now I'm going to have my, same as before, my value and my on change. So we've got my value equals, and it's my this dot state dot text there. And now when I type here, well, nothing moves. Okay. And of course it's saying I'm missing an on change, a typical warning. It's saying, wait a second, you give it a value. You need to give it an on change as well. So let's put a pin in that one. Let's go ahead now. And first let's just put my text here. I'll just say, um, Initial text. There. So now my state has two things in it. We agree on that? And it shows there. There's my value. So this is great. Initial text because I'm saying value equals this plus state text. Sounds good. What's going to happen if I press my plus button? What's going to happen to my state, do we think? Now, that's increment. It's going to make a new object with a counter in it and replace my state with this new object, isn't it? What about text? This is the same problem as before, right? We're deleting or overwriting our state object. With just this, wouldn't I go something like um, dot, 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 this dot, state, comma, so I don't overwrite my text, right? What if I didn't do that? Let's try this instead. Let's just make an object with only the counter in it and say set state to that new state. And we expect it would just blow away our text. Let's try that. But it doesn't. Look at that. Let's look at my dev tools. What's going on here? Let's go to dev tools, go to my components and let's take a look at my class component. There is my text right there. Three initial text. Now, if I go set state, I'm calling it with a new object right there, which doesn't include text, does it? It just merged. It didn't replace them. So that's kind of cool. No more spread. You don't have to go dot, 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 state, comma. You don't have to give it a copy. Okay. It just gives you no answer. Yeah, exactly. Mitchell, finally, something that is a little better with class components. It does merges of the state, which is very cool. You don't have to give it a object with the new one in it. It'll just it'll take your counter, it'll merge it back in and replace that part of it. So yes, finally something that is a little advantage of class components. Not much, but yeah, it does 
handle state a little more elegantly that way. You don't have to give it the complete object. Just give it the piece you want. It'll merge it for you. This is not so bad. Okay. But uh, back to our problem. Let's go ahead and we're going to finish off our input. So what was my on change? There it is. So it's complaining that I haven't gotten on change. So if I type something, well, can't type. I haven't got on, on change. So let's make an on change. We go on change equals, let's put it in line for now. Because it's the usual event to target a value, right? It's the same thing. So for E arrow, and then we'll say uh, set or this dot, this dot, all these this is set state to event dot target dot value, our usual on change. Oh, wrong one. Let's put it in our in our input instead. There. Look the long. Okay. There we go. All right. What's gonna happen? Let's take a look. And nope, oh, takes the object of oh, of course. Now I have to set my state to an object, don't I? So there. And text colon. Huh. It's a little trickier. Uh, what am I doing here? Oh, hold on. Getting close. And one more. Curly brace. Nope, inside. We love class components. Okay. So set state to a new object with the text as event.target.value. Whew. Okay. Take a look. And it does work. Look at this. There we go. Plus, plus, plus. Now you may be asking yourself, hey, wait a second. Wait a, wait a second. What about that, that this is undefined thing? What's going on with that? Anyone notice that? I'm not getting the error. I got my my function, my event handler, but I didn't do this increment.bind. How did I get away with it here? So why would that be the case? Who wants to guess why this would be the case? I can get away with it here, but I couldn't get away with it here. Well, let's try something else. Let's do this instead. Let's go function e. This is kind of scary. Hold on. Uh, okay. There. Oop. How am I doing? Let's put them a separate line. There we go. Okay. I have a function. This is undefined. Oh, okay. Looks like something's going on here related to function versus arrow functions. Because this is the same thing, just a non-arrow version of that. If I made this E with an arrow, just leave the rest there, what happens? It works just fine. All right, so it looks like we have a, a this thing going on here. Now, anybody remember our arrow functions? One of the quirks about arrow functions. We read this, didn't we? Something to do with this. I remember that in the cobwebs of my mind. Something about this with arrow functions. Let me take a look here. JavaScript arrow functions this. Sure. Huh. In short, there is no binding of this. Okay. In regular functions, you get the this represents the object that called the function. So in an if it was a function function, we would inherit the this from our DOM, right? But with an arrow function, you don't bind it. There's no this binding going on. So turns out 
this is actually not a bad way to do it. Okay. And that's kind of ugly actually, but it does work. Let's take some of our there and there and do that anymore. Do that anymore there. Okay. So if we use an arrow function, we can get away without having to do the bind. Let's test that theory. Instead of our increment here, let's go. Okay. Give it an event handler. And we'll say this dot set state to a object. So it'll be an object with counter and it'll be this dot state dot counter plus whoops one plus one. How are we doing with balances parentheses? I think we're okay. Okay, let's try this. That works too. Okay. So it looks like if you want a named function, if you want a named function, you got to do this stuff. And this is not a big deal. This is a one-liner. We all do this. Because although this is fine, well, barely fine, because it's kind of long, if it's any longer than this, it really deserves its own function, doesn't it? You wouldn't want to put something long, like, like a map in there and a bunch of other stuff. It would get messy really, really fast. So although, yes, with an arrow function, you don't have to worry about the bind. Sometimes you want a function because you got a bunch of stuff to do. So in this case, you have to use your named function increment, which means you got to bind the this. So yeah, this is a problem with class components. I'm going to do it. Okay. And it's got this, it does have the cool uh, merge of state. So what do you think? Do you think the, the merge of state benefit is worth the pain of the other stuff we have to do? I'm kind of torn. I don't think so. They're a little difficult to use class components for a variety of reasons. Not the least of which it's a class, a function. Easy. It runs. It's very, very easy to predict what this is going to do. When this is going to render, it's going to run app from top to bottom. And you can see exactly what's going to happen on each line. And no worry about this because there is there is no this. There is it's a function. So it's much easier to manage and uh, debug functional components. And functional components, they run once and they're done. You're, you're, you're finished. You don't have to worry about it anymore. Whereas with a class component, it is a long-lived object, which means this stuff all sticks around. It is only this render that runs over and over and over again. Okay, well, what about things like um, use effect and data fetching? Or I want to run something when this component first renders. What do I do? Now, you'd think that the increment or the constructor runs on first render. And you'd be correct. This runs as part of constructing the component. But remember, use effect is really just what? What's the equivalent of use effect in jQuery? Use effect has an equivalent in jQuery. It's document art ready, isn't it? That's really all use effect is is just document art ready. It means run this code when the DOM is ready. So we're using a use effect. That's all it is. There's nothing more exciting about use effect than just when the DOM is ready, run this use effect. And you can do things like empty um, array, which means only the first time, or give it some parameters multiple times. But really all it means is the document is ready. That's what it means. Or has mounted is another term. Or mounted on the DOM. But in class components, we don't have that use effect. It's a hook. Only works in functional components. We have to have another method. And this is where they had what are called the life cycle uh, methods of React. Since it's a long-lived event, it is born, mounted for the first time. It then lives on. 
click, 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 stuff happens, but the object doesn't go anywhere. Unlike a functional component that gets destroyed every single render, this survives. So I'm thinking, wait a second, this is the more efficient because that's an awful lot of work. I had to render every last thing, every render of my functional component, I'm destroying everything. That's not the case with class components. You don't destroy everything. You just destroy this part. These functions stick around. This is pretty efficient because this can be some pretty long, complicated stuff that you're doing. You don't need to rebuild all this stuff. It does the render. So yeah, it does build the new DOM, but it doesn't build all the other stuff when a component renders. So how can I know when my component renders? I want to find out. Well, that's what's called the lifecycle methods. Remember we talked about we um, in our shapes, where's my shapes? There it is. We inherited this say name function, more very base called there, say name. And right now it just says does something, I'm a shape. It doesn't do anything useful, but we can override that and make it do something useful. We can change say name to do something a little more useful. I'm a rectangle, I'm a line. So it is much more useful than just I'm a shape. Well, the same is true with React Components. Since it is a class, you also get some methods that are built into here that you can override. And those are called the lifecycle methods. Let's take a look. I've got a little diagram here. Where's a little diagram? Um, there. I've got one here. There we go. So this is kind of what happens, or this is what happens when a component lives, lives its life and dies. Mounting. So when it first mounts, it calls the constructor, then it calls the render, and then DOM stuff happens. Click, 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 type, 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 there. But when it first mounts, it calls component did mount. This is a method or a function that you get from the base class or the super class, which is component. Component did mount. So I can declare that here, right here. I want to say component did mount. There, there's my function. And I can over, now I've overridden that. Now the default one doesn't do anything. It is empty. In fact, inside of React, that's what it looks like. Does nothing at all. So I can override that and make it console log something. There. Component. Mounted. There. Okay. So now when this thing first renders, I should see component mounted. So I am overriding this method, which is empty. Once again, the React version of this is an empty one. So if I do nothing, I'm gonna, if I don't include this, I'm gonna get the default, which does nothing. There. So this is like our use effect. This if in effect is this is like use effect. So I can do this. And with empty dependency. So this is this. Use effect with an empty dependency rate it is called when the component is mounted for the very first time. <clears throat> okay, that's one of our lifecycle methods. There's other ones. There's, where'd it go? There it is. Okay, so now updating. So now I'm typing, I'm clicking away, I'm calling my event handlers component did update because I'm setting some state. And as we know, when you set state, that triggers a render, doesn't it? So if you set some state or new props, you can also do a force update. There's actually a force render inside a component. Let's take a look at this. That's kind of cool. You can call, I uh, like doing this, but force update. You can actually force a render. I would advise don't do that too much. Okay. But it's kind of cool. You can, you can force one. You want to really make it happen. Try to avoid using it. 
Okay, but set state, as we know, this definitely would trigger a render. <laughs> so those are two things, and a, and a props, of course, can do it as well. But really, props are just somebody else's state. It's going to call the render function, and then it'll do my updates to my DOM, all my stuff, and then it's going to call component did update. So another lifecycle method is component did update. Now this one is interesting. Okay, so oh here, let's say component updated. There, exclamation mark. That's exciting. Okay, so now if we type stuff in, there updated. Click click click. There, let's type something in. Also triggers component updated. Well, the point is, well, yeah, but what updated? Huh? Because remember this, I want to be something like this. Now, for example, maybe I want to listen to counter, but how do I know? Because it's just calling this function. Doesn't matter counter and I type, I get the same function called and I just see component updated. So how do I know, was the counter that got updated or was it the text or whatever else state I've gotten here? Cause I can have a lot of state, which one updated. So this is the problem because it won't tell you which state it was that uh, updated. So we need to handle that. Okay, so there's a trick. Since they own, there's only one of these, unlike uh, use state, and you have multiple use effects, you can only have one of these. You have to figure out which one it was that did update. Now, fortunately, you get this, prev props, and you get prev state. So they give you this. Okay. Then you can, you can figure out what changed. Is there an easy way? No. You got to figure it out yourself. Here's the before and you've got the after. So you got to figure out what on earth changed. So well, I want to say, well, did the counter change? So I'll say, if my prev state dot counter is not equal to this dot state dot counter. Okay. That means my counter must have changed. I'll say counter. Counter has changed. There. Okay. Take a look. Counter has changed. If I type, I don't get counter has changed. So now I, I can detect <coughs> which of my state has changed. And the same thing, I would do the same with this. I do if my text is not the same as my text, then my text has changed. And I can even put these two if I want. I can put them right there. There. Prev state, I'll say prev state dot text and prev state dot counter just so I can get something showing in my console logs. Okay. So now my counter is changing and my text is now changing. Seems like a lot of work, doesn't it? It is. And yeah, there's no way around this one. There's no cool trick or no function. This is it. It's a whole bunch of ifs. Now you can imagine if you have a lot of state in this component, guess how much work that's going to be to figure out which one changed. Yeah, it is. So this is another problem with, uh, with class components. 
there's only one. So you have to do all these ifs. Now we, we put these in helper functions and all kinds of cool stuff. And there's other things we do in this. There's a package that were written to handle this specific problem. So you can imagine some people, a lot of people have written some um, modules for this, but really we have to do this at some point. Okay, so there's my, and this is the most common one we use. This one we use and this. There's another one, which is the use effect when we want to clean up after ourselves. Remember the clean up? Things like a web socket, or if we open up some kind of connection, or we make a permanent change, like maybe a set interval in our browser. We've told our browser, start a set interval going. So the browser is doing that, and it's outside of our control now. It's just go ahead and it's, we just clicking away, making that uh, that interval every time. We have to get it to stop. So there's another lifecycle method that's called will unmount, component will unmount. So as it's just about to die, it calls that function. Easy enough. We add it in here. So go to my class component and I'll say component will unmount. So component will unmount there. And a console log uh, component about to die. It's there. Yeah, that's all we get. Now you notice it's will unmount because obviously if it's already unmounted, it's gone. It can't call the function. So this gets called just before the component is 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 uh, garbage collected or trashed, if you will. Okay, so those are the three main uh, life cycles we use. Did mount, did update, and will unmount. Who's loving class components? They're a little different, aren't they? They're, they're not bad in some ways. There's some advantages. I mean, I like the advantage of it doesn't call all this stuff again. All the stuff here? This is only called once. It only calls render, render, render. I like that. So it seems I'm gaining some efficiencies, but turns out React has other hooks that allows us to handle that in uh, functional components. Okay. But it's it's a high price to pay. All this, this stuff going on, all of our binding, um, it's kind of cool with the merging state. I kind of like that. That's kind of nice. But <clears throat> other than that, it's, it's a little tough. Let's take a quick look at how we got here. Okay. That's kind of interesting. There. React. A little bit of a history for a couple minutes before we call it a day. History. History. Okay, so React has been around since about 2014, <clears throat> and it was version 0 0.12.0. It was November 21st, 2014, version 0 0.12. People tend to release version numbers of 0 dot when they think it's not quite production ready. Like, I'm not ready yet. I don't want to go and say it's a 1.0. I'm going to call it a zero. Well, the question is why use class components versus functional components? We will talk about when we should use them and when we shouldn't. Um, performance is one um, thing, yes, because the render is always being called, but there are ways to mitigate that in functional components as well. So it's not as big an advantage anymore as you might think. All right, so have our, our dot zero version. There's, there, came out on November 21st. Zero dot 12, okay. Then they made some updates. Of course, they discovered some things and version 0 0.13 came out. That was um, March 10, 2015. Okay. And then 0 0.14 came out. Um, and was about October 29 of 2015. 
It's a lot of happening in these two years. There's a lot of stuff, as you can see, is going on in these two years here. Okay. <laughs> we had 0 0.12, dot 13, and dot 14. And then they had a change. 15.0.0 came out in April 17th of 2016. So wait a second. What happened there? Did it like all of a sudden jump like 15 plus versions? Well, no, of course. You can see the pattern here. What they did, they said, you know, it's been a couple of years. People have using us a lot. I think it's time to make this a, a 1.0. So they could have just said 1.0.0. But they chose not to. Because people were so used to calling it React 13, React 14, React 13.4, React 14.1. They literally just forgot the zero. They stopped, stopped saying it. So instead of going to React 1.0, they just made it React 15. And I think we're up to, I think we're up, up to a React 18 now. Okay. Everyone's so good, just got so used to calling it 14, they just made it 15. This is not uncommon. Um, any any Java programmers know the same thing happened with Java when they went from 1.42, 1.3, 1.4, 1.5, 1.6, 1.7, 1.8, 1.9, 1.10, 1.11, 1.12, 1.13, 1.14, 1.15, 1.16, 1.17, 1.18, 1.19, 1.20, 1.21, 
using functions in JavaScript or using classes in JavaScript is always a bad idea. We always try to do something else. Experienced JavaScript developers try to avoid using classes. Okay. And prototypes either. We use we try to use closures and um, idiomatic JavaScript rather than using classes or uh, prototypes. Okay. So it was hugely popular. It allows us to put our state now inside our functional component, right? So the question is, as we asked before, well, when should we use a class component? We've learned all about it. When should we write class components? Well, I've got a diagram here that does describe when to use a class component. Don't. Yeah, I like this diagram because it really captures the the essence of the uh, of the of the, of, the, of the topic. And no matter where you start on the circle, it takes you right back to the same place. Anywhere, yeah, don't. We just don't use them. So we will not be using class components on the job, except for maybe two reasons. So. Some pays you a lot of money to do it. Yeah, sure. My principles are for sale. No <laughs> problem. I'll, I'll make some class components. You pay me lots of money. I will certainly do that. More typically, though, um, it'll be likely translating class components into functional components. Because a lot of companies have large component libraries. like hundreds, thousands, and the cost to convert them is prohibitive. So you may be asked to support some class components. Um, that's the way it goes. They, they literally cannot afford to make that switch all these thousands of components and translate them. Maybe a few, you may be assigned to convert a few, but yeah, make the intern do it. Yeah, good point. That's we always do. Yes. Here's all the work with it. We don't want to do. Oh, the new hire is showing up. Yes, that's their job. But you got to try to make it easy stuff, but yes. So lots of money or um, you're working on a, a library and we have no choice because because we have all this investment in uh, class components. And there's thousands, tens of thousands. Companies invested a lot in React, millions of lines of code. The cost is prohibitive. We can't, we can't change them all. Now, obviously, we try to convert our new stuff to functional components, but our old stuff, we may be stuck with class components. But in general, uh, we would not write our final project in class components. Please don't do that. Um, I wouldn't recommend it. All right, everyone, that is our talk on class components. They're kind of cool. You notice a couple of cool things? In my, you notice this state. You may see this still people using a state object. And it's like, ah, that's why I see this state object because it's a holdover from class components. Now, we know that React tells us don't do that, does it? The official guidelines are don't use deeply nested complex state object. You want a user? Make a use state for user. You want a pet? Make a use state for pet. You want a photo array? Make a use state for that. You want topics? Make a use state for that. Don't dump them all in one big state. But people have been doing this for years. A lot of years doing class components and old habits are hard to break. So you'll see people still using big mega state objects and making it hard to work. Now, we did that in our photo labs to teach you about immutable updates. Uh, you would not do this in your final project. So please don't make a big state object, please, in your final projects. Make state individual use states. All right, that is our talk on class components. Have a great rest of your Tuesday. We'll talk to you again on Thursday, because now we start some testing, which is actually really fun. And Thursday's work is really, really fun. All right, everyone, have a great rest of your day.